Hello, and welcome to this uh, session entitled, Bring Your Own Infrastructure or Who Needs to Run a Control Plane Anyhow? Uh, as you can see, I have a Halloween oriented theme. My name is Bruce Basil Matthews. I'm a senior solutions architect for Morantis USA. And I've been doing this since before there was computers when we used abacuses and slide rules. I have with me today my good friend, Count Schmesh, to talk about these things because he is the premier authority on service meshes. And I think there's some applicability to this. Would you like to introduce yourself, Count? Hello, my name is Count Schmesh and I'm doing this for Bruce as a favor. I had to get out of my coffin. and I hope I can get back in before the sun comes up. Thank you, uh, Count Schmesh. I know that your full name is Count Service Mesh, but they call you Schmesh just to make it easy. Uh, hopefully you'll be around at the end of this to answer some questions. Uh, so today let's talk about what we're actually going to be talking about, where we are, where we were, where we were, where we are, and where we will be. Uh, we'll start with where we've been and writing the applications. We'll talk a little bit about uh, microservices and service decomposition, which I think is very important. We'll do some comparisons of bare metal virtual machines and containers and a category I call who cares, which uh, I think I'll unveil to you as we are presenting more information. Um, we'll do the case for each, add service, uh, services and some more uh, services down the road. And then we'll talk about some of the mechanics of the who cares category, which I think is uh, an interesting uh, side route to us. So let's start with where we were, are, and will be. Um, you know, when you started out doing things with punch cards and paper tape, finally the uh, green screen became a really fantastic uh, advancement in computing history. Um, when you then had to wait for a card stack to process versus a mini computer proc processor to run it, it was a huge advancement when it got there. And when you could set up cron jobs so you didn't have to sit there and watch it to start it off and finish it, that was even better. And debuggers have gone through a tremendous amount of improvement. At this point in time, they wouldn't even stop at the line that failed. You had to figure that out yourself. Um, and we hoped that when it no longer mattered where you had to run something, that we would have reached nirvana. Um, writing applications on bare metal was kind of a, a more straightforward chore. Uh, you had application programs that you that dealt with your business logic and had nothing to do with how the computer ran. Um, and because computing resources were finite, they were like gold. You had to make sure you only used as little as possible to get your pro uh, process done. Um, you had to write special uh, drivers and for things like printers and storage and all of that kind of stuff. And they had to be initialized in your environment when you were running something. And you had to run code through hundreds of cycles of testing to make sure that it wasn't going to fail once it was executed in production. And if it did fail, it was always the hardware's fault. Uh, once we got to virtual machines, there was a lot more computing resources available, so people didn't get to be so picky about uh, code size. And as a result, we started writing bloated software. And then we started sticking them in libraries so we could move them from one place to another. Um, debuggers actually it did improve to the point where they were pointing at lines and uh, telling you an idea of what you may need to fix. But because uh, there were different flavors of Unix and none of the uh, Unix providers had come together and decided on a single set of libraries, um, you had to recompile it for each one. There's a, one for HPUX, one for AIX, one for SunOS, one for Solaris, because they had two flavors. Um, and uh, the f idea of recoverability came into play and you needed to deal with that. But if code failed, it was because of the hardware, definitely. 
containerization started to come in uh, in the last uh, two to three years. And we're going to talk a little bit about the microservices and the microservices architecture and the containers themselves and uh, their, their uh, configuration. Uh, and we'll point out some of the differences between can uh, containers and virtual machines. Um, a little bit about service decomposition, because that's a, my favorite uh, uh, perspective on the thing. And recoverability was more my job now as the application developer on containers. But we had some uh, shift left uh, self-healing rules to rely on. Um, and we would use those to be uh, to fill that void. Um, since I don't have the uh, an understanding of where the uh, actual container may be running, uh, what physical hardware or anything, I can't really blame it on the hardware anymore. Okay, so let's talk about microservices and microservices architecture a little bit. Um, the architecture itself is a, a set of services that communicate either synchronously or asynchronously to uh, maintain um, their connectivity to each other in a, a stable way. Um, data consistency is passed from one datagram in a container to the next datagram in a container and so on. Uh, services then can be developed independently of each other. So your your coders can be hundreds of miles away and thousands of miles away and never actually deal with each other, only because the, the schemas might be well known at that point for different containers. Um, the persistent storage comes with each container, so it's self-contained and you can decouple it easily and move it to another uh, service set. Um, data consistency is event driven, and we'll talk about event driven in a bit. Uh, generally speaking, it's up to me <laughs> to ensure that the data consistency across services exists, and that's part of the developer's responsibility now. Okay, so let's talk about the event driven um, uh, architecture for a cloud native uh, environment such as Kubernetes. Events occur, they are captured in queues, they are passed off to a mediator or mediators. Those mediators have channels registered with them, um, requested by the consumers, and each event consumer takes a look at the data that's being passed to them in the event, and if it's applicable to them, they process it. If in that process, they don't change the data set, that's the end of the event queue for that uh, particular event. If there is a change in the data set as a result of being processed by the event consumer, that, that event comes back to the front, it goes through the queue, the mediator, and back to all the consumers again. So you get the idea, this is kind of how this event-driven stuff works. Um, but the real important part of that is the ability to do decomposition. Uh, you have to start here, whether you're moving from bare metal or you know mainframe to a virtual machine to container uh, and and to beyond to the serverless world and and uh, beyond that. So here's some guidelines for it. Um, and you do it at all of those levels, regardless of what you have done before, you take a look at it to see what can be decomposed into microservices. And you look at it from, you can look at it from a business capability standpoint. You can look at it from a design subdomain standpoint so that there would be a hierarchy of them. Uh, it's easier to find things that way. Um, you can also do it by taking the actions that are in the coding that you're uh, decomposing and, and isolating each one of them as a uh, microservice uh, or nouns, uh, you know, typical re resources in a, uh, a grouping and those resources can uh, then be identified uh, in a, a uh, catalog service catalog and things of that nature. I like to use the verb and noun re, uh, cases for doing this because then I can write code 
that emulates the human language to accomplish it. OK, uh, very quickly, um, when you've done this effectively, everybody's got a single responsibility principle, much like the grip uh, utilities in the old Unix world. They do one thing. They do it very well. They're very loosely coupled because they have their own isolated persistent data sets. Uh, each one of them publishes an event in its data chain uh, when it changes the data and that event gets processed as we talked about. Uh, other services that can then consume that event and uh, process them in an event driven architecture. Um, are microservices the way to go for everything? Um, the best answer I can give you is it depends. I mean, if you have achieved everything that you intend to achieve in terms of being able to flexibly change the code and uh, uh, introduce upgrades and updates uh, rapidly and all of those things with simple decomposition, you can stop there because every layer that you're gonna do thereafter from the containerization becomes a layer of complexity and expertise that needs to be acquired by your organization. Additionally, the networking would, uh, it requires some additional layers of complexity in terms of it. So I'm always asking myself if the value add of containerization and microservice generation um, is greater than the complexity that it introduces, it's probably a good idea to put it into a microservice. Otherwise, leave it as a you know virtual machine driven application. Okay, let's talk about the uh, actual platforms themselves. And we're moving along really quickly because I need to get to uh, uh, this done. Uh, they told me pretty rapidly. All right. Uh, in the bare metal world, host operating system sitting on top of bare infrastructure uh, apps run on top of that using the host operating systems libraries and binaries and all of that kind of stuff. In the virtual machine driven world, they've introduced a, a hypervisor in between, Hyper-V, KVM, Citrix, take your pick. Uh, and sitting on top of that are complete guest operating systems of different flavors. So you could have Windows and Linux and different flavors of Linux. And each one of the apps use the isolated binaries and libraries presented by that guest host versus the host operating system that's supporting the hypervisor. Uh, in the containerized world, they put together the same level of uh, infrastructure using a single operating system and have introduced some kind of container engine. In this case, the Docker engine is depicted. And each one of the containers themselves have their own binaries and libraries built into them, uh, running different uh, applications in each uh, containerized microservice, uh, but only relying on that single operating system to, to run with, uh, within the uh, uh, container engine. Okay, uh, bare metal has a lot of benefits. Uh, the workload demand requires it. An application has some special need for a GPU or an SRIO uh, smart card for uh, networking. Um, you don't have to deal with noisy neighbors, fewer moving parts, and the network has less complexity. If I plugged in the, the NIC and it works, I'm good. Uh, on the virtual machine world now, it helps you to do that decomposition by allowing you to utilize more of a physical host to host separate application services within different operating systems. Um, since it runs on top of the physical servers, the, the hardware is emulating uh, phys the, the physical hardware and virtualizing everything. Uh, the hypervisor lets you monitor and create and run virtual machines, uh, and they act as a layer between the operating system and the virtual machine, kind of isolating them. Um, each virtual machine has its own unique operating system, so you don't have to worry about crosstalk between them. And virtual machines, different operating systems can run, so Windows and Linux in the same uh, host, physical host, running a Linux flavor or whatever. Uh, 
there's a case for microserv uh, microservices and containers, uh, to, which enables a, a much higher level of performance uh, of your application development teams and your developers can really uh, start uh, running these things predictably on different environments, regardless of where they're hosted. Um, it provides an isolated way to run all of these systems on a single host. Um, sitting on top of the physical host OS, as I said, there's a, a container engine running, um, shares the kernel and usually the binaries and libraries from the OS kernel, plus those that have been compiled in the microservice itself. But uh, from the result of the microservices, they're extremely lightweight. So they start up instantaneously as opposed to a virtual machine, which takes a long time to boot up before it's useful. Okay, we've done that whole thing of uh, re uh, working from bare metal to virtualized applications, um, and we decomposed everything, and they're all in containers. Now, what do you do? Um, well, if, just think if you had a secured registry so that only your groups and organizations could access it and you notarize those containers and place them in there so that if an application actually needed encoding, for example, it, the container that provided that service would simply be in the catalog and show up and start up and pr do the processing necessary for encoding. You, you don't have to make sure that there's a server available or scalability or or networking or or anything else before starting it up because the infrastructures are all running continually um and i know people say oh well, that's serverless computing but not exactly uh, serverless computing really ties you down to the provider so aws uh, google uh, microsoft each have their own um, a library of serverless calls. And each one of them is different because they won't standardize. Why? Because they want to lock you in. Um, we need to avoid this and here's how. What if instead of relying on their um, infrastructure only to do the orchestration and cataloging, we st all standardized on Kubernetes. Everybody's running Kubernetes. It's the same kind of Kubernetes straight across the board. We place all of their serverless calls in custom resource definitions that they could share between uh, clusters. Um, this would take advantage of people uh, skill sets that already exist in the marketplace and only make them better. Um, Multi-cluster applications are all of a sudden a voila because everybody's running the same basic orchestration. Um, and some resources can be shared into the private domain and the public domain uh, for uh, this uh, application development to occur, which means that the developer is completely flexible as to how to do it. And then if you engage something like service mesh, count mesh comes into play here. And using something like Istio, you could manage the se and segment the networks out for traffic that was only dedicated to your clusters versus everybody else's clusters. And you could ensure both quality of service and security. Okay, let's take it one step further. What if sitting in that service mesh that is connecting all of your clusters across public and private providers of resources, um, it was uh, providing both a neural version of the network and machine learning algorithms. It could predict in advance which containers were needed at any given point in time in a service being uh, executed and simply bring them up when needed. And that way you could scale the containers when you need to for that particular event and then remove them and bring them back down. Um, and you could scale it across multiple infrastructures. This would be fascinating. 
Uh, this would also minimize the cost of maintaining the infrastructure because uh, you, you know you only got uh, less of it being used at any given point in time. And the biggest thing we could do is base all of that on the context of trusted computing so that that container knows it can run on these trusted computers because they are in the service catalog that's associated to the discovery mechanism within the service mesh. And it imagines that there are stored in the trusted registry, these instantiations of servers and devices and containers to be able to be applied to your application services. Um, this methodology would make it a really distributed computing as we envisioned it when we drew it up on whiteboards uh, 10 years ago, maybe. And uh, it mitigates the security risks because of the uh, integration of the trusted platform modules. Um, to do this, we're going to need to standardize. Uh, the security models will have to be all the same authority models so that people recognize your authority with a certificate that's uh, trusted by you to that computer and all of those kind of things to live harmoniously across all of the flavors of infrastructure we're going to be dealing with. Um, and that allows us to do it for containers, virtual machines, and bare metal, which I think is a feat. Okay, shameless self-promotion in the last few minutes I have here. Uh, there's a blog that goes into the details of the neural network and applying uh, service decomposition to that network in order to uh, be able to distribute computing. And then one, because I've developed myself and I've used the tool, but is now owned by my company, um, Lens is a developer's uh, tool to be able to access and, um, you know, uh, deploy to multiple flavors of uh, uh, both Kubernetes and uh, the Kubernetes framework so that you could have uh, instances that were sitting in AWS and instances that were sitting in a private uh, cloud or even on bare metal that were being accessed and code was being written to. Um, anyway, take a look. Hope you enjoy that. Now, we're going to leave the last three or so minutes of this presentation for questions and answers. And hopefully um, I've given you some at least food for thought, if not something that you can go out and get excited about. Um, thank you very much. Have a great day.